One of the most magnificent and moving descriptions of the cross was written many years before Calvary. It was written by the prophet Isaiah and recorded for us in Isaiah 53. I'd like to read the first six verses because they give us a picture of the cross and what was done for us on Calvary. Hear the word of the Lord. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Ah, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hear the word of the Lord. Gracious Lord, bless us with the power of the Holy Spirit that we might be able to understand the awesome words that we have read and experience them in the depths of the hurts of our hearts and be set free in your holy name. Amen. There are two basic spiritual laws that guide my life and guide my communication. And sometimes I have to rediscover how to live them myself. I teach them all over the country to clergy and young pastors and leaders. I try to help writers and uh, people who try and communicate to others how to apply these laws. And every so often they come home to roost and I have to learn how to live them for myself. The two laws are these. First, only what happens to you can happen through you. Can't give something away that isn't yours. You can only help another person to learn what you've been through yourself. And secondly, you can only reproduce in the mind of another person but you are in the process of rediscovering yourself. So it's fresh, up-to-date experiences of the reality of truth that enables us to make those truths real to other people. <coughs> Sounds fine, doesn't it? Until you have to live it. This week I sat down to a manuscript for this morning's sermon and realized that what I had written before 
had to happen to me. The title of my message was Healing the Hurts of Life, and I sat reading my own manuscript, realizing that what I'd planned to say to you, I needed to hear myself. Inside of me was a heavy rock of hurt. It was the cumulative experience of many days and weeks collecting the problems and needs and concerns of others, the profound hurt over other people, hurt over people who are close to me and whom I love, hurt for friends, and then hurt for the immense, complex, collusive power of hurt in the world. And as I sat there, I realized that I couldn't preach to you about healing the hurts of life until I experienced what I wanted to say in my own inner being. And I want to tell you that thinking through the implications of the suffering of Christ touched my suffering. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, how when we consider the suffering of God in Christ on the cross, we can identify. And the more we focus on what he did for us, the more liberated we become from the suffering that comes into our own lives. And as we take our suffering or our hurts, one at a time, and give them to Him in a wondrous way. The healing that comes through the cross penetrates down to the depths of our being and heals us. We know again that we are loved unreservedly, forgiven unqualifiedly, cared for unreservedly and planned for without any restrictions. The Lord knows us, cares about us, and is with us. Today is Passion Sunday. Can we have a Passion Sunday in the midst of this sex-centric, sensual world in which we live? Has the word been robbed of its meaning? I don't think so. Especially when we understand that the word for suffering in the Greek was translated into the word passion, which meant suffering in the Latin. And then when the Vulgate was translated by Wycliffe, it came into our language so that we speak of the passion of Jesus. We go to passion plays. We feel that in his passion, we are healed. And so, Passion Sunday is the Sunday on which historically we focused on his suffering and tried to find how it touches our suffering. And it's all there in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Isn't it amazing that years before the cross, Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, described each intricate detail with the gift of prophecy. He helped us focus the monarch with a marred face, the mangled, strained, and persecuted body the details of the anguish of the cross and the implications for our lives. And the wonder is, the more you look at the cross and allow the love that was expressed there to grip your heart, the more you can deal with your suffering. You can come through the tunnel of that terrible hurt inside onto the other side 
to the victorious bright side for the Christ who died for us, rose from the dead, and he's alive. And the secret is, surely he has borne our grief. The word for grief in Hebrew is koli. He has carried it away. The word for carry is nasa, which is the same word that applies to the role of the scapegoat. In ancient Israel, as you remember, the sins were placed on the scapegoat and Aaron was taught to take the scapegoat out into the wilderness and leave it there to die, and with the scapegoat, the release of the sins of the people. Surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. The one word means the grief that is the limitation of life, that forces us to say goodbye to a person, a situation, a problem, a need, anything that breaks our hearts and causes hurt within us. This is healed by Jesus Christ, who enables us to know that he suffered for us. The word sorrows in Hebrew, makab, means pain. Whatever the pain is, physical, emotional, interpersonal, situational, whatever racks our lives and tears us apart, whatever the hurt is, the misunderstanding or being misunderstood, the brokenness, the hurt, he went through it for us. Francis Bacon said, only God and the angels are observers. It's not true. God is no observer. He's in the midst of it with us, suffering with us. Catherine Mansfield wrote at the end of her life in 1928 these words, Before I die, I want everyone to know by this record that suffering can be overcome. Anything that's submitted and accepted can be changed, and suffering can be turned to love. Now, compare that with Vera Britton's statement. Terrible circle caused by suffering. It makes one tense, and then hard, and then disagreeable, and soon the people around one get tired of the suffering one, and soon the rejection is multiplied. And now the loneliness of the suffering is multiplied, and there's no cure in sight. Which of those would you like? I take Catherine Mansfield. And the way that her suffering was turned into love was that she accepted it, asked God to heal it, and then became a healing source in the lives of other people. You see, he's carried, taken the burden of our sorrow. But also, he was wounded for our transgressions. A transgression in Hebrew and in Greek means stepping over a line. And the line that God has given as a demarcation for the guidance of his people to keep sanity in the world is the line of the Ten Commandments. And for those of us who are Christians, we have the law of love of Jesus Christ and then the implications of the epistles and the writings of the New Testament that give us what it means to be a Christ-centered, authentic person, to step over to do that which we know is wrong is a transgression. Now, he was wounded for our transgressions. The Hebrew means he was speared right 
true. The sinless Son of God. But not only that, he was bruised for our iniquities. And the Hebrew word for bruised means crushed. It's a crushing of his body there on the cross. And the word iniquity here means twisting and bent, reshaping. See the interrelationship? Step over the line, and pretty soon the inner nature is reformed and shaped into a distorted, inconsistent inner character. He was crushed. Christ was crushed so that we can be made new creatures and live a new and a different life. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is he a new creation? The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. For he made him to be sin who is no sin, that through him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the secret. It's in that magnificent substitutionary sacrifice that our hurts are healed because we see how deeply he loved us and we can turn the very suffering of our life into a commitment to join with him in healing the hurts of the world. But not only that, the chastisement for our peace is upon him. Chastisement means punishment. It means that the punishment of God for the sins of all the world were put on to him. It's the kind of God who loved us so much that he could not tolerate the idea of eternity without you and me and sent his beloved son to be speared and crushed. But if that doesn't move you, move on. By his stripes, we are healed. Do you know what stripes are? Long pieces of leather. The Hebrews just put gnarled pieces of leather. The Romans went further. They put actual pieces of metal so that when a person was given the stripes, it tore the flesh right off the bone. By his stripes, his suffering, we are healed. And that's the miracle. It's from that self-giving oblation for you and me that healing flows. And when your inner being is filled with one great knot of hurt, you can ask him for that healing and he will set you free and allow you to turn the suffering into love. That makes all the difference in all the world. And so Amy Carmichael could pray, give me the love that shows the way the faith that nothing will dismay, the hope that nothing will ever destroy, the passion that will burn like a fire. Oh God, let me not sink to be a clod. Make me your fuel, flame of God. And it happens as you take each one of the hurts and give it to him. The consuming fire of his love 
burns it away and sets you free. He giveth more grace as the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. And when we've come to the end of our store of endurance, when our strength is spent ere the day is half done, the Father's forgiving has barely begun. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power, no limits known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth.